Hello and welcome back here downstairs at the exhibition floor at Isomart TV. It's Tuesday, it's the second day of Congress and we have a lot to come for you today. In the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to talk about why you do research where. I don't know if you just switched from uh, Channel 1, you've been watching the session uh, upstairs. I was in the room, these were some remarkable stories. As we speak, four of the speakers of that session are being rushed down and uh, getting ready to join us here in these seats. But um, to fill that gap, we have some news to bring, because I'm joined by uh, Finn Raben, the, the Director General of uh, ASMR. And um, last night, you launched the Global Market Report for the market research industry. Yes, that's right. It's, the, uh, it's our annual report on the size of the industry, which thankfully this year shows our market to be growing again. Uh, maybe not in overall terms all around the world, but it shows that there's certainly positivity in the market and that for many of the companies that are now involved in the analytics side of the business rather than the more traditional data collection, there's huge potential for growth. So it's a good sign, I think, for the industry in total. And it's now $43 billion minimum and probably somewhere close to $70 billion. I mean, that's bigger than the online TV games You say market. probably? That's a, that's a big uncertainty. Well, the, the traditional market we measure very tightly. Yeah. But the, the extended market, which includes all the new analytics uh, sectors, we don't have as good a mechanism for getting at. But we do have a number of sources, one in particular that we use in the U.S., which gives us that kind of information on a uh, on an estimated basis. So that's why probably. So uh, right. we, we think it's at least $65 billion. We think it's probably closer to 70. All right. And you say there's a lot of growth opportunity in the analytics side of the market. We, we hear that a lot. We, ha we hear a lot of people in our studio saying, well, th this market needs to change. It's, it's, it's moving from data collection to analytics. Um, if, if people watching right now, what message do you have for them? What, what can they do to actually move further down that scale? Yes, or Good, up, yeah. I should say. Well, great question. Yeah. Um, I guess a little bit of history. Before, when people needed information, the only trade, the only profession that could provide that were market researchers. We were the gatekeepers, if you like, to that data. Nowadays, data is being produced by everybody, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's just simply through blogs. The, the advent of the internet, the advent of digitization has allowed people to contribute data without ever needing to be asked. And so the, the gatekeeper function becomes, if you like, less important and the analytics and the synthesizing element becomes much more important. And that's why there are huge opportunities in that area. This is not to say that the traditional market is going to die, of course mm. not. There's always a need for really good, solid, traditional types of research. And uh, the report actually also goes on to talk about work that they do in, um, you, you know, troubled areas. So if you have to do work in Liberia and you're looking at how you measure the incidence of Ebola or if you want to do work in, you know, Syria about ISIS, they have yep. to be very carefully constructed samples. Yep. But generally speaking, the analytic side is, is where now the big growth opportunities exist. And later today, uh, in the lunch break, we're talking about the, the skill sets needed for that. Because do you feel that, that the companies and, and, and the human resources that are now present in the market research fields are fit for purpose? Can they actually make this step? I think all the basic skills are there. After all, we as market researchers, we're still the people who can work with data best. We know what data is, how to use it. And you'll hear an awful lot about big data. I mean, you know, does big necessarily mean good? I'm not so sure. It means but a lot, right? It means a lot, right? <laughs> uh, but smart data is important. So we can have all the data we like in the world, but we don't have to use all of it to answer the questions. We need to know which bits of that data to use. So smart data and the ability to decide and to identify what's relevant to the business question, that's what market researchers do. Yeah, and, and, and that just makes me think of another discussion I'll have later today in the studio where we talk about with, with clients about the fact, and we heard it before here in the studio, that we're so data rich and insights poor. What is your take on that? Well, I think, unfortunately, and I, you know, I'm a researcher for all my life, but we are relatively conservative. So moving and the, the, the desire for change and you know, the, the happiness about sitting in your comfort zone affects all industries and all professions. But I think from what we heard yesterday, that rate and pace of change is accelerating all the time. So we do have to switch the emphasis. We are data rich, 
but we're probably the only people that can leverage that data as well as anyone else. So huge opportunities, yes, huge opportunities for the future of market research as a career. And, and can you perhaps show us some, some key indicators? What, what do I see either in my company or, or in the talks with my clients that I perhaps might not be grasping all the opportunities? What happens to me? Well, I think speed is one of the most important things. Clients have a huge demand to get information into them and back out into the marketplace quickly. I think if that's not happening, then maybe there are alternative mechanisms and methodologies that you should use. The ability to, to generate insights from observation, the ability to look at ex, you know, previous data sets and see how they can be further leveraged within your company is also a huge source of material. And if you're not leveraging all of those, then perhaps it's time maybe to talk to another market research company, see what they can do with the information. And, you know, I... And part, partner, partnering part, up, partnering up, Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think, there, I mean, there were two speeches yesterday from which I, I, the two nuggets that I picked. The first was Susan Hayes, the economist, who said, you know, don't wait for the perfect moment. Make this moment the perfect one. Yeah. And there's no point in waiting for it to come to you. Go and grab it. You know, the Nike, just do it. Yeah. And the second thing was the, the comment made by the guys from Unilever where they said, you know, the rate of change will never be as slow as it is today. It wow. will keep accelerating. Yeah. That's you know, a scary quote if you it, listen well, to that carefully. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, you look at your mobile phone and there's more computing power in your mobile phone than there was in the lunar landing capsule, you know, however many years ago. So those kinds of things, if, if we are ready to embrace them and grasp them and move on, fantastic opportunities. Exactly. exactly. And, and if our viewers really start to do that, then we will then see that in the Global Market Report of 2016, we hopefully uh, see that uh, in the numbers. Back to the Global Market Report, what is SMR, what is that being used for? How, how can either our viewers or how are you using that data, that information, that insight to leverage? Well, I think there are two main areas that the report is key. First is to identify those areas of growth, the markets of growth, and an, an, awful, an awfully large number of the books are actually bought by investment houses and financial institutions to see where the markets are growing and with what methodologies. The other part is by uh, many members of our own profession currently to see what are the, uh, because we also do a number of guest interviews, and they say what are the hot points, what are the kind of things that are keeping people up at night to see, I guess, are there opportunities for them or are there areas of interest that they should be looking at more. It's, it's um, you know, you would say, well, I would say that, wouldn't I? But it is a great book because although we, we collect the numbers from you know, a huge number of contributors around the world, and I, I owe them all a really, really big word of thanks because the report simply could not be built without them. The, the expert interviews, and we talk with the CEOs of some of the major multinationals and looking at the, the challenges of research. And as I said just a moment ago, we, we tend maybe to concentrate sometimes on fast-moving consumer goods, and we don't think about the work that's done in Afghanistan or yeah. you know. Yeah. So those kinds of perspectives in the book are they, they're just eye-opening. And when I read the book, I can tell you I'm proud to be a researcher. Exactly. So so it's not only about reporting on the current state of the industry, but it's also the second part is much more inspiration, right? That is something you want to read. I hope so, and maybe even revelationary. Exactly. Well, Finn, thank you very much. Let's do a, a quick look forward because later today you'll be back in the studio, uh, especially in the in the lunch break show today. That's right. Where we're going to talk about switching roles. Yes. What is that all about? Well, I, you know, what I'd love to do is that uh, you've been very good at kind of getting input from uh, from the various exhibitors, the various delegates, and we'd just like to switch it around. And we're going to post a question out on Twitter. We'd like to hear from you to say, you know, what is it that you'd like to see us talking about in the next year? And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and host some of it. I'm not going to be nearly as good as you are, Hurt. So you've done a Thank great, you. fantastic job. But yeah. I'll try. And uh, guys, if you're out there so and you've got thoughts, send them in to me. So we're going to crowdsource the content yes. agenda for 2016, right? Yes. Well, Let's that's very it. exciting. Uh, mark it in your calendar. I think uh, by heart it's uh, 3.30 uh, right. Ireland time. So uh, uh, wherever you are in the world, make sure you're there. I've tweeted it already, so guys, send your tweets back to me. Exactly. Hashtag Isamar TV. And that's also there for all your questions, all your, all your comments that you want to ask, either to Finn, we'll save him and, and pose them to yep. you uh, later today. And if you've been watching Channel One, also for our viewers, um, uh, for our presenters from Channel One that are coming up. And I'm going to thank you very much, Finn. Thanks, Fred. It's I'm been great fun. I'm going to take your microphone back to another corner of this little studio where we have Marcel van Overveld. Marcel, good morning. 
Good morning, Gerrit. Good to have you here again. In a, in a minute or so, we, uh, the, the seats will be filled with four of our presenters from the Wow You Do Research Wear uh, um, session. Totally, yeah. Um, that was a very interesting session, very compelling, very short stories. So I can imagine that if you've been watching that, you have some questions, either to Natalie or to Marita, to Alexander or to Fatima. Um, how can these questions be entered into the studio? Yes, well, uh, as, uh, as our uh, online viewers, uh, some uh, or probably a lot of them already know, but for the new viewers, welcome. Uh, please use Twitter and tweet out with ASMR TV. Hashtag ASMR TV. Hashtag ASMR TV, that's correct. Or use the interactive panel below the player where you can send in questions um, or comments uh, and chat so we can pick it up. I will view that and if there's a nice and good or interesting question, You'll I will be sure to feed it off to you. Yeah. yeah, because that is something new on the Ismar uh, real estate. I don't know if you've been watching before. In the other channels, you don't have such a thing. But on channel three, if you scroll down, there's a box where it says ask, chat, or vote. And specifically, that ask tab is something we uh, invite you to use right now. Yeah, so uh, totally. that you can then post your questions. And if you, if you don't have a question yourself, perhaps you see someone else pose a question that you like. And yeah. there's actually a like button. Like it, definitely. And, and just to uh, under, underline that it is working, uh, Finn just uh, tweeted out uh, to send in some suggestions for the afternoon session, which uh, Christopher Welter, as we uh, perhaps can see we can on see the it view, on screen. Yeah, on that's screen. Uh, Christopher reacted to that directly with a suggestion where we, which we will address to Finn later on. So, so it's keep, working. Yeah, definitely. So, so we keep actually have viewers coming. and uh, they are responding. Totally. And it's good news. Thank you very much, Christoph. And um, if you're watching from elsewhere, maybe this is the time to also take a picture of where you're watching. We heard Natalie refer to it on stage. Her colleagues in Africa are watching. Well, we would be very curious to see what that looks send like. A picture, guys. So send a little picture and you can either tweet it to us, hashtag IsamarTV, or on the chat tab, you can just upload it in the chat and we will be then perhaps able to show some of that yeah. back to you in the uh, yeah, broadcast. Totally. Go interactive guys, go interactive. Thank you very much and uh, with that I see my panel has found their way to the seats so let's move back. Good morning everyone, welcome back. Thank well you. we have, we're not sure, some of our viewers have been watching you on stage, they already know who you are. Some of our viewers might have been watching channel 2 so they literally have no clue what you were talking about. We have on uh, your right it would be on your right on my far left Natalie Forche you shared a story about how you do research in South Sudan yeah. which in the program everywhere uh, is referred to as a war zone and I saw the email where you said can we stop calling it that because there's actually a recent peace treaty there right yes yes we, we there just has been a peace treaty signed in South Sudan and you know a lot of the places where we work we call them challenging environments definitely some conflict going on but war zone tends to make it sound like it's a horrible place, and for us it's a place of, of inspiration. All right, well, I'm glad we were able to set that straight. Um, next to you is Marita Schimpel. We saw you on stage talking about how you are opening up research in Myanmar, in a company that is just opening up itself, and you're making very broad and bold, brave steps there, I think. Thank you very much. And um, on my right, your left, we have Fatima al -Khatib. You talked about the challenges of doing research in Saudi Arabia. Yes. I think that was rather humorous, right, <laughs> with the picture of the covered ladies. And on uh, my far right, your left, we have... Um, uh, we Never have seen. someone I wasn't expecting. I was actually expecting Alexander. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you very much. But luckily I was in the room. So I was yeah. expecting Alexander talking about uh, doing research on gangs. But uh, um, you have to help me with your name though. I'm Ibrahim. Ibrahim, Ibrahim that was it. Yes. And you talked about how you do research in Iran, right? Yes. And how the Iranian right. respondents are actually quite atypical. For, right. for our viewers who haven't seen that, can you explain a little bit I mean, about the story you shared? Oh, definitely. Uh, so uh, the first time I did research in Iran, I was getting contact rates around like 80% response rates of around 86%. Yeah. And you know, that was quite surprising to me. But when I started listening to these interviews, I realized that people are actually eager to speak to someone about their opinions. And not only they share their opinions, they provide reasoning behind their opinions, they engage in a deliberative kind of a mode to in fact form opinions. So when, when on, on an issue they don't have a formed opinion, what they do, they engage the interviewer in, in a deliberation to, uh, as a way of uh, forming of an forming opinion. Their opinion. Yep, yep. And I think that touches on the topic of, of cultural differences. Exactly, and and yep. that was an element in the stories of all four. 
And I'd like to open up the floor talking about, I can imagine it's very struggling that if you're dealing with global brands and global brand managers who maybe are US headquartered and are very far developed in this market research field, and then you have to kind of talk them into the wooden house. <laughs> I mean, how, can you share a little bit with us? How, how does that work? How you bring them down from global to local understanding and, and understand how you have to work with your environment? I like think it, it already helps if they would come out. And then in the proposals, you you put in many many photos and, and and you just explain to them, you know, that that it's a, that it's a different market. And I have to say, I think most clients I will understand. It's it's a bit of a hard work in the beginning, right. uh, because I think we are in a very fast-paced mindset. You know, we we, we want to send out, you know, the request for proposal quick. We want to have the yeah, answer. Quick. Budgets under blah, pressure. Blah, 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 we have know? to be efficient. And so you know, you 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 have to bring the client into a different sort of uh, mode. You know. You're nodding, uh, Natalie? No, absolutely. I mean, having the client come out is, is the best way to address this issue. But a lot of times there's just a lot of conversations about, about how things are different. And one of the big challenges we face is we're doing research in places where some of our clients don't even know it's a country. I mean, South Sudan gained its independence in 2011. We get RFQs all the time for Sudan. We have to politely write back and say, well, excuse me, we're actually a separate country. They're like, oh, fantastic. Could you do that as well? <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, educating the client that we work in. Yeah, yeah please add. Actually, for the Middle East, I mean, I spoke particularly about Saudi, but if you take a take close look at the Middle East, I mean, there is a lot of particularity for every country, which makes it even more difficult because sometimes you're doing a study in, let's say, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, and uh, Saudi, and these three countries are extremely different in their attitude and the way people react, and even the setup of the field, etc. So a lot of pictures, and I have to say, some of the clients, or let's say largely, the clients rely on your on your local expertise. They call you because you know and you live there and you've been really close to the field so they rely on your expertise and they trust you on that but you have to do all of this in a very fast manner and a very cost-effective manner so yeah, that's exactly. the challenge so, so bringing out the client is that a, is, a, is that a practice you can apply or is that a wish not always no no. I, I think, I think for, qualitative, for qualitative research, of course, I think uh, many, many times they, they, they will come out, actually. All right. And, no, and, and also, and eh? also uh, I think, sorry, I think uh, these days, many of the big uh, global companies who come to a market like Myanmar, they don't come from the States. They have their original headquarter in, in Bangkok or in Singapore or mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. So for them, so it's easier. The cultural to, gap yes. is not as large yes. as we can imagine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in my case, it's a wish. I mean, I wish my clients could come to Iran. They usually rely on me to provide them with the local knowledge. But the way I get around the issue you, you, made, you made is that I, I tell them how rich of, richer of a data I'm providing them. I'm not only providing them with the response option that people have given, but the reasoning people are providing for those response options and how the respondents think the questionnaire could be made better. Yeah, exactly. you, know, you, can't, you, you know, you can't beat that. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I don't want to apply pressure, but I'll go ahead and say it. The good, the good clients come. Yeah. Yeah, the really do. good oh, clients oh, come out. L they let's do. apply some pressure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's the whole reason why this session is an, in this conference. That's the whole reason we bring you out into the studio to actually show the world that doing research in different places is not a, a one-size-fits-all thing, actually, right? Yeah, the one-size-fits-all thing. Because most of the studies that are, are cascaded to our regions are usually globally led. So oh, yeah. uh, yeah. there is a lot of oh. like stereotype. I'm not stereotype, but there is a lot of template that we need mm, to follow yes, usually yeah. and I can safely say 30 to 40 percent of these templates are not viable in our regions Correct. and yeah. so a good client who's actually willing to adapt to the local specificities specialties or specifics is, is very uh, is very helpful definitely. I'm sorry Fatima are you saying that the Middle East isn't one country Definitely not. <laughs> because I yeah. and, we, and, we too have to deal with the And Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai, and, and I got a question like, uh, what's the currency in Abu Dhabi? I'm like, Abu Dhabi and Dubai are in the same country, yeah. and it's the United Arab Emirates. And then like, and how is this different from Bahrain? I'm like, this is a totally different country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so there's, there's yeah. a lot of, a yeah, lot of uncertainty and, and, and knowledge. Yeah. However, um, if we say we have, to, uh, um, uh, we have to change to the local situation, this is a global study, how are we going to aggregate the data, right? That's yeah, the next that's question. The yeah, that's basically the problem. A lot of times we tell our clients that, look, if you ask this question in this way, you're not going to get the responses that are going to be useful. The responses you're going to get is that people are actually mean this. They don't mean what you want them to, what you're getting out of this question. 
And there has been instances where the client was that hard that this is the instrument I'm going to use, no other instrument. Because and, I and want to be reason, able to compare yes, across and, the world. Uh, and there has been instances where the whole research was unviable because of the structure and some of the response options. I was part of the, yeah. uh, part of the uh, survey instrument. So I think it is very important uh, if, there, if there's a message you could get out to clients. Yeah, yeah please do, because it we is have very, a global audience. Yeah, it <laughs> is very important to take full benefit of your field agents who have local knowledge. Uh, you know, from, from U.S., thinking about how a survey instrument should look like in Iran, you know, uh, things could go really wrong really badly. And, and but still, idea, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I think yeah. the idea is not to change the question and the questionnaire or to change the areas of information that you need to gather. The, the point is to just adapt the language and adapt exactly. the way you actually ask the question. Eventually, the key indicator, the key performance, the KPI, it remains the same. It can still be the same. Yeah, it's, it remains the same. It still could be benchmarked to a certain extent, but it's just the way you ask it and the different options that you put out there. You know, I mean, you can't come in and do a study about beverages in Dubai and say, would you have a beer uh, on a terrace? Exactly. Like, yep, you don't yep, have beers yep. on terraces in right, Dubai. Right. There are no terraces in Dubai yeah, to stay. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. too hot to sit outside, and beers is not served this way. So uh, this is what he means, I believe. Yeah, yeah. If that, I understand that, that's terraces. a very obvious one. Yeah. 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 Um, by the way, if you just joined us, if you have a question for any of our panelists, uh, please make sure you break in either to uh, hashtag Isamart TV or to the interactive question panel that's on the bottom of your screen. Um, moving into a next area that, that all four of you shared is the enormous amount of creativity that you need to actually overcome some of these barriers that you're, that you're being on fun. I mean, your story about how you all of a sudden uh, invented WhatsApp. Yeah. as a resource means. Yeah. Actually, the respondents do get creative with you, you know. I mean, at some point, I mean, in, in, in our part of the world, people are very warm and they're very social and they connect with you on a personal level. After a focus group, there is a very, there is at least a 60-70% chance that people share their numbers with me and, and they become reunions. my friends. Exactly. <laughs> they become my friends and they want to like get, hang out, etc. So people bond a lot. So they, they tend to co-create solutions with you. So they know that you're trying to do your job. Uh, once they get that, they, and you're a woman trying to connect with women, they help you out. So they were the ones suggesting WhatsApp. They were the ones suggesting home visits. So actually, they co-created with you. Wow. How is that in your end of the world? I mean, for us, creativity is the key to what we do. And uh, that's really where we look to the creativity of our staff. We try and ensure that they're solution-oriented. And one of the things that comes to mind recently on a project, one of our our fantastic staff, uh, who's actually hopefully watching from Cairo, um, Oriana was sending a team out into the field, um, again, where they were going to be out in the middle of nowhere for, for nearly a month with potentially no access to electricity. We needed to be able to see the data before they returned back to the capital. And so Oriana rushes into my office and she says, Natalie, listen, I, um, I need your credit card. Right. I'm buying solar panels. I'm having them DHL'd uh, from the UK. They should be able to arrive here in time. I have, this, I have the charter plane standing by. And we're going to have the solar panels that are going to plug into the netbooks. The netbooks are then going to be on the Zane sticks. The Zane, and I'm looking at her and I'm going, I, <laughs> here is my credit card. You seem to have this all sorted out. And she had. I mean, she had really, all of our staff, they, they use these amazing creative solutions to get around those challenges that, as I said in my presentation, when you first arrived in South Sudan, they just said, high quality research isn't possible. And we've been able to find those people who say, no, it is. It is. We just need to figure out a way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another way, uh, we don't face those same kind of uh, infrastructural challenges yeah, the, in the, Iran. The base level. Uh, the base level yeah. is there. Uh, the challenge we are facing is not a challenge. It's actually, if you look at it in a different way, it's an opportunity. It was, it was being perceived as a challenge by previous researchers because they wanted to adopt, adapt to these international standards of doing a survey in a structured way and whatnot. I think our job is, to, is not to impose structure on people, but to accept this structure in the societies and adapt ourselves to that structure. And once you do that, you see there's a lot more opportunity than a challenge. So it's a, it's a different perspective that you have to take. Once you take a different perspective, I think you will see more opportunities than challenges. I, I, I totally agree because I think if we judge with our eyes, I think we, we won't go uh, far. And I have actually come across a brochure of uh, our company. Uh, which is like 10 years old, and they are describing how they do the field work. 
so on foot, with the ox cart, with the boat, and I thought it's awesome, you know? And uh, maybe, you know, it, it is a normal way to do, you know, research in, in rural Myanmar at that time, you know? Is it a challenge? Yes, of course. It's not as fast, you know, as in our Compo countries. Compared but to the modern yes, day. Yes, it's, it's yeah. always a matter of comparison, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I think it allows you, if, if I listen to your stories, it allows you being stripped or deprived, we talked about deprivation methodologies uh, yesterday in the studio, being stripped from all that luxury, so to speak, infrastructure-wise, really brings you back to the core of the research profession, right? Absolutely. Exactly. It actually puts you straight, you know, and you start thinking about the priorities yeah. and all of those uh, quality standards that you need, you have to maintain and you let go of anything that is uh, extra. So, for example, if you don't have a one-way mirror, use a CCTV. You don't have a CCTV, put a chair, you know, open the door, put a chair, let people People listen in. I mean, they will still listen in. They will still get the the feedback, but it doesn't have to be high tech. So yeah, you, you have to get creative. If the if the room is not uh, neutral enough, I don't know, put some something to make it more white, um, the same more white on the on the walls. I mean, we did that. We did that in Algeria. I remember we cleaned rooms. We we covered the the walls of rooms. I mean, just because this is what you got, and you're in the remote area, and you really need to do stuff according as much as possible according to the protocol. Yeah. So so if we explore that a bit, oh. We have an, an audience question. Yes, Marcel, please break in. Well, Gerrit, it's not so much uh, a question as uh, I would like to share the love that we uh, received from uh, South Sudan, uh, from er Eric Whittaker um, to Natalie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's probably on screen and they are saying they're watching it from South Sudan oh, and that they are nice. so proud of you, Natalie. So I just wanted to, to share that and share the love that and, is and we coming want to through celebrate that, right? If you're watching, this is channel. what it's like, right? If, you, if you're watching, you have access to a mobile phone, which they even do in deep down Africa, right? So you can use <laughs> either Twitter or our chat uh, box below. Send us your pictures, send us your comments, send them your love if you want to. Um, and, and, and please make sure you take full uh, opportunity of the, of, of the situation that we're offering right now. We started to talk a little bit about priorities, and I'd, I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit more, especially for our viewers watching in a very luxur luxurious space with all the infrastructures, with high-speed internet, with large databases. What could you teach them or what could you share with them about the core priorities? Or let's, let's take it personal. What have you learned about the core priorities of the research field? I think you need to understand the objective of the client and how we get there. Okay, it's, it's a different question, but I think the client can't expect that we exactly follow the same path. We will totally, you know, fulfill uh, and, and yeah. deliver on the objective, yeah? but how to get there may be a bit different. And I think that's, that's I think, the, the and, and key. And what have you changed in the way you operate or in the way you, you relate to your clients to actually make sure that that happens? Well, it starts with timings. Especially in the rainy season, you know, we can't be as fast when we have to do a nationwide survey because uh, many, many areas can be flooded. So that is something where you have to talk uh, with a client about, you know, getting maybe a bit more timing, more, more time to, to run the survey. Uh, but also, um, you know, giving the client, it, it, I think it's a matter of trust. Because what I have experienced is, uh, especially in the first years, is that most people treated us like, you know, we are, we are stupid, you know, like we have no clue at all. On the client side? Well, but also client, also other agencies, whoever, you know, but because I thought, oh, this, company, uh, this country is now opening up and there are people, you know, those people that have no clue at all. No, that's not true. You know, as I said, you know, there was an industry on the ground for already 20 years. Of course, it was not, you know, like the same type of market research which is required now, but there was a lot of expertise and there is a lot of expertise. So I think it's a matter of, you know, people wanted to control every single step because they thought we, we, we haven't uh, got the expertise in doing you know, simple field work, you know? Exactly. Which actually you know, made our job even more complicated. You know, sending out you know, protocols and, and whatever, you know, field work updates every day, you know. Kind it's, of to, uh, to manage the yeah, client side yeah. and keep them at ease. Yeah. But I, I think by now, I think people, people have, have trust, at least you know, people who are, who are working with us and there are also many more other agencies now, so I hope clients uh, can relax and have trust in what we are doing, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to add on to that, uh, this this perception that because we're we're in these countries, we're working in these environments, that there's no base level of skills yeah. there. I, I can't reiterate enough how much that is not the case. Yes. Right. Of all the places I've worked in the world, um, and all the places that we work now, South Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, and Congo, the the individuals we've been able to find to work with our company have been 
absolutely inspirational and amazing. There's a lot of skills here. Yes. There may not be a lot of formal education. We do not have a graduate studies of master research program at the University of Juba. But what I will tell you is that if you take the time to invest, you're going to get high quality research. You have to build that trust in your clients and say, yes, you know, we have national researchers that are going to go out and conduct this research. They're not specialists in, in, in fast-moving consumer goods. And they're, and they're not specialists in, in your particular product. What they are specialists in is the country and the environment where we're working. And Which you have to trust us. It's actually more relevant. In the, actually, Absolutely. The, the, the importance of being local is, is higher than being uh, an MBA grad, I would say. Absolutely. And again, not to put the pressure on the clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think we need to, to shift a little bit of the priority here. We have to say, look, local knowledge is what is the most valuable. We can help you do your jobs. We can help you sell your products and change your policies. But you have to trust us. We know where we are. Because this seems to be a, a broader theme, not only in the remote countries, but I've, I've heard it before in the studio, like the, the metaphor of going to the, uh, the, the garage and to get your car fixed and not dropping off your car, but then telling the mechanic you need yeah. to use that screwdriver, you <laughs> exactly. need to put it on that. Exactly. that. That is what this industry is facing, right? The exactly. clients come too much into your profession. Now you can say they have to trust us, exactly. but how, how can we, how, how are you doing that? Now, I, I can't uh, emphasize more than on the fact that the objective of the client is very important. So the client has to be very clear about what they are trying to achieve. Now, in terms of when, when it comes to micromanagement, they have to realize that that level of micromanagement in some instances could in fact wreck the... It's going to damage... It's going to damage the issue. So if we want to use the, uh, the metaphor, the analogy of a garage, yes, bring in the car, tell us what is wrong with the car. We will show you how you're fixing it. Now, we never tell our clients, just trust us, you know. No. Give us your objective and we will deliver the data, and then, no, we walk them through step by step. We tell them, okay, if you're doing this for this reason, we go, we attain their authorization, we go to the next step, and then we go to the next step. Step by step, we walk them through the process, and it becomes an educating, educational process for them as well. Next time around, the trust has already been developed, so they come with the objective and say, I'm sure you know how you're doing, do what you're best at. And that's how we uh, take care of the issue. And, and how can I envision this? Is this a very formal thing? I mean, is this all about writing on paper? Um, yeah. um, we do it quite formally, actually. Uh, you know, when, we, when they give us their objective, when we develop the questionnaire, we get their signatures on the questionnaire. When they, uh, you know, approve of the questionnaire, when we uh, want to, you know, tell them about our methodology, we write it down, we get their approval on that. Now, convincing them that this is the right methodology, that's informal. We don't exactly. write pages yeah. of, you know, of reasoning behind it. But we tell them this is exactly what we want to do because we want to be totally transparent uh, with the client. We don't want, because on one hand, we have to attain the trust of the respondents. On the other hand, we have to also attain the trust of the client. So if you're that person yeah, that's in a between. Very balancing position. And this balancing, is, it's, the, it's both an art and it's a science uh, of it as well. And this is what we do at iranpol.com. This is precisely, these are the process, and we tell our clients from early on that this is the process we're going to walk you through. Bear with us, at least the first time. Next time, you'll take, you'll take less time. I think part of it is, though, too, you, you, have, to, you have to recruit good talent. Um, you have to bring great people into your organization who really know what they're doing. Now, we all know that the Netherlands is highly regarded for, for its market research industry. We've heard everyone talk about it. And uh, I'm proud to say that one of, the, one of the greatest Dutch methodologists is in our firm down in South Sudan right now, right? And, and part of that is you have to recruit very talented and unique individuals who have the same passion for excellence in research that you do and, you know, help the, have them help you in these countries where you're working. And they're there. There are people that are willing to come. And I hope that some of the people here at Congress, uh, as we talked about, will, will consider coming and, and building capacity in the countries where we work and, and help some of the more emerging markets uh, as we improve our market research methodology. Because that's a big shout out that both of you made on stage, yeah. right? I mean, we need to f have a flow of intelligence and brain power into these areas. Yeah. I think what Natalie said, I think the enthusiasm and the creativity is there. And, and I'm, I'm so proud of, 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 of the team I'm working with. They are really excellent, bright people. But of course, what, what is not there is because of the lack of, uh, you know, the opportunity to have that education is uh, many things like, okay, let's say, what is a concept? What are the KPIs of a concept? 
But I think if you, if you uh, uh, finish school or, or university in the, in the Western world, maybe, well, if you have studied marketing, maybe you know, but you also have to learn. But I think also from, from the clients, I think clients should, I, I would ask clients also to be patient. So what I experience is, I think, let's say the first half year, people were saying, yeah, okay, it's Myanmar. We know, you just opened up, you know. But the patience has gone. But as I said, you know, you can't build the whole industry on the level we are right now within even three years. It's not possible, you know, it's not possible. Yeah. And, and people are bright, people are great. But, so, you know, like we all of us, you know, I'm in the industry since over 20 years. I haven't been, uh, you know, brilliant from day one, probably. You know, exactly. nobody you has, need you to know. have the room to grow. Yes. yes. Hey, another theme I would like to explore with you guys, especially from the very different regions in the world that you come from, and it's a big theme also uh, in this studio, is not only about collecting and, and, and localization, but now we have to communicate our insights, right? Yeah. And we see creative workshops. It's about, we talked a little bit about how do you take your clients along. Um, we can produce data sheets, we can produce written signatures. Actually, I have to say that um, personification and its bigger um, uh, definition works very well. I mean, most of the, the, the prejudice, let's say, that they have about uh, certain uh, consumers is just like an, a normal, expect it's not prejudice, normal expectations about consumers, which is highly driven by the Western world. This is what people come in to, yeah, to our countries with. the typical stereotype. Exactly. Um, I have to say taking in a lot of pictures, uh, taking them along to visit homes, uh, bringing in consumers. At some point in time, I brought in consumers to the presentation and I actually made them kind of like confess the truth in front of them just to show them that at some point in time you might you might be dealing with a totally different culture but I have to say we're not living in isolation anymore the media is really exposing a lot okay so people do have some uh, an idea that you're dealing with a different culture the only thing is they're not sure how different and they're not sure uh, in what way so they're expecting something different, but they're not. Sometimes they get a bit shocked when they know the truth about certain certain uh, habits and attitudes. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, um, for example, in Haystack we do something called uh, Shopper Safari, or we do, let's say, uh, Consumer Connect, which is basically meaning taking the clients, the marketing, sales, R and D, etc., and putting them into consumers' houses or with shoppers on the floor and making them roam around and spend enough time with them so that they can, uh, let's say, accustom themselves with the with the even with the language and the way they talk, and then you, uh, and then it becomes easier after that. Yeah. It becomes so, easier. So Context, that's actually a, a big investment even after the research. Oh, definitely. In, yeah. Context creation in our in our case is very important. A lot of clients come in with objectives of like, I want to test this concept. Okay. To me, it's never like that. It's like you have to start from a little bit behind to understand where do these people come from, what do they use, how do they use it, and then test your concept. Because in isolation, the concept means absolutely nothing, and it's probably going to be far off on your expectations of how it will do if you don't know the context behind it. So definitely. Wow. Well, absolutely. So you, 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 three similar things. Yeah. yeah. Three of my colleagues down in South Sudan, uh, Haley, Dang, and Steve and are working on a huge project that's creating an audience rating center uh, for South Sudan. Uh, huge challenges. And last year we, we went ahead and we piloted a, di a diary system in South Sudan. And it, it had very interesting findings. My personal favorite being when um, after we distributed the diaries, we trained the respondents on how to fill them in. We went back to collect them and, well, we were told very frankly, um, my goat ate my diary. So, your goat eats your diary. Yeah, yeah that's, that's I mean, what you have to do. Goats eat anything, with. and you can't leave your diary laying right. around. You know, so that was the first uh, sign that we might have to look for a more innovative uh, approach yeah. to to audience ratings in South Sudan. Um, but you know, we brought together some of the, the the best minds on the matter, and we're really, you know, like you said, it's about introducing new ways for people to share information. Absolutely. People want to tell you these things. Right. It's not that it's a secret. It's not that there isn't an inherent trust actually in the research process. But you have to find a way that really speaks to the respondent so that they feel comfortable sharing that information. One thing, speaking of like, the goat ate my diary, I mean, it was somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Egypt and uh, we were doing detergent uh, study and actually what happened is that the woman, we left some piece of cloth and the detergent, assuming that the woman will use the, 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 the clothes, will wash it and we will come back and take it back from her. Huh. And what actually ended up happening is that she kind of gave a bath to the kids using the detergents because, and that's, it's, it was actually, I thought that we were 
not considerate enough doing this type of research, going into a home where absolutely there is no flooring, there is no furniture, there's only one big TV, huge actually, and there are some, some cows roaming around in the background and assuming that she's going to actually cooperate. I mean, we have to feed her first, we have to give her a little bit of money to actually get uh, the basics done in her household before asking her to uh, participate in such a study or change, or change the methodology altogether. I mean, it, I mean, we did care about the kids because it's poisonous to kind of like, so yeah. we did like yeah. get scared, but eventually nothing happened. But um, this is when we were saying, okay, this methodology doesn't work. It's either that we give her more or we change the approach. So, um, I mean, when it comes to communicating with the clients about the final results and delivering yeah. the, the insight, now, you have one instance where the client is totally clueless. I find those instances to be actually good instances because, you know, you they're clueless, you have a clean field. Now, when it comes to Iran, they already have all these kind of misconceptions, I would say, and they already have decided what the majority of Iranians are going to say and how they're going to feel. And every result that you give them, it's a surprise to them. And you know, the first one is a surprise, the second one, the third one, and at, once you get to the end, they're like, really, is this, is this what, what it is? Is this what you're getting? And that's when the local knowledge becomes really important for you to explain why it is. Why it is rational for them to pick response option B in that context. You have to basically destroy all of their preconceptions and build it up, uh, you know, yeah. ground up again. And then it is, you know, once you do that, they say, wow, you know, they feel as if they have learned something new. And now they know how they can either sell their products, uh, you know, uh, pursue a certain policy in Iran that actually going to achieve their objectives. So, so how, if I may, how are you doing this? Because this is this is the process that right, needs to happen. Right. We're not conveying data. We're changing perception. Right. But how are you actually making this happen? You, you talked about the shopper safari, about the bringing respondents yes, along to your connect, presentation. Yeah. Can, can you share right, some examples? Right. So, of that? one of the ways that we we do it, we always insist on having a face-to-face -face presentation of the data with the client. We always insist on that. A lot of times clients say, you know, send us the send report, the report we'll send the data, it. we'll do it ourselves. We insist that we, it would, and sometimes we do it, you know, with little or no cost to the client because we know that this data needs us as an attachment to it. Without it, the, the client is going to look at it and it's just going to be a stop. We have to tell them about why it is that you know, people, we have to provide the reasoning, the background that is required to understand the data. Um, a lot of our experience has been that when clients just tell us, you know, send us data, we have our own analysts, they'll do, <laughs> they come back to us, they say, can you explain why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this then, is then you end up with that, that way. anyway. And then you end up with that anyway. And we always, uh, we, we look at that as an opportunity, uh, both to build the trust with the client and to make the data more, uh, applicable and more relevant to the objective that they are pursuing. Exactly. I can only uh, um, also stress what, what you said, it's about the context. So what, what, what uh, we try to do is for each study to have a chapter about the context. Exactly. Because the context matters big time. You but know, that's, it's, that it's, is still a written chapter, that's something in no, the report. No, it's, uh, yeah, or, or photos. Okay. Very, very highly visual. I think I think you need to work uh, with uh, with lots of photos and really to come across what what does it actually look and feel to be in that context and what what is actually the consequence for your product or for your brand. I think that's that's very important to understand because the context from from the surface it may look similar, but if you dig deeper, you will find out it's it's actually not similar. Very different. Yeah. 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 For us, that's why we decided to strategically ensure that we're able to invest in high-quality researchers from those areas, right? Even within within our countries, I mean, beyond the country that is Africa, within each of those countries, you're looking at very diverse cultures, very diverse practices within those countries. But you're saying you use that to communicate uh, the yeah. results as well. Absolutely, because you know when, when our clients are able to speak with individuals who can say, look, this is my area of this country, and this is how I interpret the data, the data that I collected, that I was a part of this focus group discussion, and I would make the same decisions. Now, I'm sure that, that you yourself and your staff know very well why it is that in rural Egypt, you would have a big screen TV and no floor. We know the answer to that question. I'm not gonna tell you, you have to hire a haystack to find out, <laughs> but, 
We know, that's very obvious to us. And, have, yeah. yes. <laughs> and so having an individual from that area explain it to your client is, is the most authoritative source, as it should be. Yep. That's actually, it feeds directly into the definition of the social economic class, because for some, somebody like Samsung, for example, a company like Samsung, this is, this is quite a good, quite a good cost consumer, but for somebody like, I don't know, um, uh, food and beverages, even food and beverages, I mean, they fall into uh, the bottom of the pyramid. So um, local expertise is extremely important and not only local in context, I have to be an Arab because Arab is a region, but it's more in the context of um, um, Saudi people, having people from the Saudi background lived in Saudi or who are Saudi by nationality, Lebanese by nationality, Egyptian by nationality, Algerian by nationality, having all of those local, like really teeny tiny expertise. The areas that we deal with is, are very rich, really rich, and they're not um, homogeneous. They have a lot of particularities across the different uh, 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 regions and the different cities etc. So the more you can hire people who are more local, the better you can offer your clients, definitely. All right. Well, very nice. And with that, uh, as you can hear, a lot of noise is starting up, so we're moving into the next tracks. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for participating. I invite you all to be back in the studio during the lunch break, where we talk about, first, the client side of research. After that, we're going to watch the um, award for the best exhibitor and the best young researcher. By the way, if you're interested in the best young researcher, you should switch to channel two, where you will see the young researchers present in room two. If you're more more interested into the world of the shopper nowadays then you should switch to channel one and uh, for those of you still watching perhaps Marcel can put on a little poll so we can actually see where you're going channel one channel two or perhaps you're just waiting for channel three to come back on thank you very much we'd love to see your tweets and comments on hash isamart tv and see you back in the lunch break